following presentation is for educational purposes only. All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website. And welcome back to Ninja Trader Live. I'll be your host for this segment. I'm Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. And on this segment, Traders Workshop, we like to bring in our Ninja Trader ecosystem partners. Today's no different. We have a new partner, not been on Ninja Trader Live before. Um, and we're happy to bring on Speculator Seth. Seth, how you doing? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day here. I'm out on Long Island, by the way. I'm out uh, all the way east, uh, uh, you know, probably about 80 miles from the eastern end of Long Island. Um, so we're doing great. How about you? Where are you, Seth? So I live in Utah. And yeah, the weather is pretty good over here, too. Uh I, I couldn't think of a better day to have, you know, so much stuff going on, you know, that way, if, if, you know, it all blows up in our face and it goes badly, at least you can go outside and enjoy the weather. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Sometimes we have to step away and, and, you know, we're getting in the, the part of the year, at least here where you can do that without putting on a coat or, or worrying about too much rain. So uh, that's great to hear. So uh, Seth, you know, we were uh, excited to see that you use Ninja Trader. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about, uh, just so so our audience gets to know you a little better, a little bit about how you got into the markets? Wow. Okay. Wow. So, you know, when I was uh, growing up, I wanted to make video games, actually. <laughs> and uh, so I went to school to be a programmer and make video games. And, and then the 2008 crisis happened. And two kind of things happened with that. One was that I realized that working in the video game industry really, really sucks. You know, like <laughs> they have tight deadlines. They ask a lot from you. They don't pay you as much because there's lots of people who want to do it. And, and then when the project is done, they fire everybody. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. And But then also because, you know, the financial crisis was going on, I got into trading and I realized, oh, like financial markets is way more interesting to me than that. And uh, so I got into that. Uh, I was still a computer guy. So I went and I got a job at one of the big banks doing computer stuff and, you know, kind of got to see how their systems all work behind the scenes. It was a lot of there's a hedge fund out there and they want to buy a big portion of a certain stock. And how do they do that? And I did a lot of like testing all of those systems and everything. And then when I left the bank, I, I said, OK, well, let's go and trade futures. So we've been trading futures now it's been well i don't know that was 2016 so it's it's been a while it's been like seven years now <laughs> that's that's great i mean you know you get a really great uh look into the market um from the institutional space which is what you're yeah, talking yeah. about when you say bank you mean banks right you mean big <clears throat> banks investment bank yeah. um and you get a sense of how how the sausage is made for uh you know kind of a crude way to put it but um, you know, if you're curious about the markets and you, you know, I, I think you have, uh, you know, I've heard this a lot of times, people who are um, very mathematically or, or logically minded mm -hmm. get attracted to the markets because there is something about the order, the patterns, the, the logic to the markets, even though it's rooted in, rooted in human behavior, um, mm -hmm. you could, you know, it's, it's a challenge, right. To, to find out where you might find order in something that's so chaotic. Well, yeah, I mean, I, that's that's kind of the dichotomy of it, right? Because because when you really get down into, like, how does the market work at a fundamental level? Like, what are the actual rules of the game, and how does that lead to certain things happening? Kind of the end result that you're going to come out with is like, uh, well, there is a lot of math, and and there are, is a lot of things that the market will do over and over and, and that we can kind of predict to some extent, but it, there's also a lot of volatility because it, basically what it ends up with is every little action that people do has an effect. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, as retail traders, because we're so small, we, we don't think about that. But the reality is it's actually a lot easier to move the market than you think. And so so every even moderate size player can come in and move things. And, and so there's a lot of chaos in it, too. And the, the market doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. This idea right. that like the markets are, are efficient is, is just simply not true, not on the timeframes that we're looking at. And I think that there's kind of a beauty in the chaos too. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, that idea of what, why the markets move and, and, you know, the volatility, we, we assume that the market does was, was what it does because people have all the information. That's simply not true, right? Not everybody has the same, if everybody had the same information, Mm -hmm. You would think that maybe they came to the same conclusions in the mark and, and there should be less volatility. But even then, it's not always about information. It's about situation as well. Right. But yeah. So, yes, exactly. So you know, so the, the way that the I kind of approach the market and in terms of like, what is it going to do? Where are we going to go? I'm primarily looking at like flows. OK, so I, I want to see things that can potentially predict future orders. Right. Well, one of the strongest forces in the markets today is these index funds that buy, buy large tranches of things. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what they think the future of the economy is or where they think the S&P 500 is going to be in a month. It's completely has to do with how many contributions and distributions they had to their fund that month and, and how well their fund did. And so their orders have absolutely no uh, informational content in them whatsoever. It tells you nothing about uh, what they think about the economy. And yet that is the strongest force in our market today. And, and you see that a lot, Seth, around crucial <laughs> dates for oh, yeah. those funds, right? So particularly you see them really strong at the end of the year and at the beginning of the year, right? Because- oh, yeah. You know, those funds have to meet a mandate that they exactly, get away exactly. from. They get away from during the during this, you know, uh, let's say it's a quarterly mandate. They get they report every quarter. So you might see that, well, during the quarter, we're going to dabble over here in this. Uh, 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 you know, they, they have a little bit of leeway that they can experiment with um, trying to get alpha, what we call alpha. Right. And then hopefully it goes their way. And then it reporting time, they go back into that, okay, we have to be 85% invested in the S&P or whatever it is, right? Yep, yep, yep. And then the beginning of the year, it's like, okay, game on. I'm going to try and get more alpha. I see it over here where we're not really supposed to be in at the end of the quarter, but we're going to try it then. So um, yeah, for sure. There is a big, big idea that um, we as retail traders look at the news every day. Uh, we look at interest rates. We look at the currencies to see what those are happening. You know what meetings are happening. Who's speaking? All this stuff. And you're right. The index funds are like, I don't even look at that. I'm like looking one. at yeah. my mandate, right? Well, well. So that's kind of where, like, trying to understand how these large institutions work and like what their strategies are can be very useful. And, and you just gave a, a very, very good example. They have to maintain a certain mix. So some, some of it will be, you know, I have to uh, stay weighted to the index, right? But right. Uh, probably a more simple example would be like a, a risk parity fund where they're supposed to have 60% of their assets in <laughs> stocks and 40% of their assets in treasuries. Right. And if they make a ton of money on their stocks over the course of that month and they have to rebalance monthly or quarterly, that means that they're going to have to sell some of their stocks and buy bonds to maintain that balance. And uh, that's why you will very often see, like yesterday, yesterday there wasn't like a super clear imbalance, kind of looked like some people were short and some people were long. But when you look at the close on those days, you will just see absolutely insane amounts of volume closing at the end of the day. And a lot of that is those large institutions trying to rebalance their portfolios for the end of the month. Right. And this wasn't even a quarterly end. This was a monthly end. And yeah. this is probably the <clears throat> the biggest move on a monthly end that we've seen, you know, Tuesday afternoon. It was, it was really <laughs> wild yesterday. I, 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 you know, I right. usually don't watch the close cause I'm doing other stuff at the time, but like 
you know, my my system will make noises and stuff. And I'm like, what the heck is going? It was it was a really big one for just the month end. Yes. Right. Right. And that all came in the last 10 minutes, uh, continued through, the, yep. you know, in the futures, continued through the end a little bit. But, <clears throat> you know, you you know, that's why I like to look at volume as well. Um, we do yeah, an end yeah, of day yeah. show. We do we call it bars closing. And a lot of volume, as we know, comes in at the end of the day. But yesterday, woo, blew it out. So um, today's FOMC day. Yes, yes. And of course, and, you can't forget that, right? <laughs> right. I, I mean, with all the drama that's happened yesterday afternoon and this morning, we had quite a few news reports that weren't directly related to the FOMC. They have nothing to do with it in terms of who's reporting. But you know that the FOMC has kind of half an eye on what happened today, and um, they'll probably tailor their message slightly to that. I won't say it's a big impact, but mm. you know how are you, how are you looking at and and forgive me, I I know you do morning shows, right? You do, yeah, yeah, yeah. You come in very early. Uh, we start our show at nine o'clock. I know you start before uh, before we do. Um, but do you do you, on an FOMC? day are you making it a point to participate at two o'clock or two thirty are you making it a point not to participate or how do you no, approach yeah it? yeah Don't, i tell you what that scares the crap out of me the the taking i i think my best trade that i ever took uh was right after an fomc I, you know it was just really really clear what was supposed to happen after it i saw a really good order flow signal at the same time and i took it and it was you know like $500 a contract within seconds. And I was like, oh my gosh. But I would say on balance, you know, FOMCs destroy accounts. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I am often just completely avoid it I, and spend that time kind of more trying to absorb what's going on. So so if I could, because this FOMC is, is going to be really, really interesting. Um, because the context around it is really, really unique and kind of creates a situation where everybody is paying attention. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I can go through that a little bit, but then at the end, I'm, I got to warn you, I'm going to kind of tell you why maybe it all doesn't matter. <laughs> so I love it. Yeah. And, and maybe if we need to show your chart, you know, let, 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 let mission control know we can show the chart anytime. Sure. You know, we might pull that up here in a second. So uh, the, the first thing that you kind of got to realize is that there is an ebb and flow, kind of a monthly ebb and flow to how the economic data comes out. So a lot of the most important reports come out at the beginning of the month. Of course, most people know that there's that non-farms on the first Friday, for instance. Okay, mm -hmm. um, And then the week after that, you got CPI. But there's also a lot of reports around that time for instance, PMIs, um, the, the uh, employment costs report that really slammed the market yesterday, right? Right. Um, another, then, then there's the, the FOMC cycle, because that, that doesn't always come in at the same time every month. It, it kind of shifts, right? Because they, they do it like every month and a half or something like Six that. Six or seven weeks. Sometimes they take an extra week. You're right. Yeah. And, and so... Um, we're in a really unique situation where, oh, sorry, I, I was going to say another thing to keep in mind is that there's a blackout period, right? Like we had mm -hmm. a lot of central bank speakers two weeks ago and then starting from last Friday. So, or sorry, not last Friday, but like two Fridays ago, that would be like the, uh, the, the 19th. So from the 19th, FOMC speakers are not allowed to talk to the public. Right. And in, in that time, we've had all of this stuff tons of stuff today and they haven't had any chance to, to say anything about it yet uh, going into the blackout period they were starting to talk a little bit more hawkish though right, right. so everybody is kind of looking for how is the federal reserve going to react to this latest data because this latest tranche of data really strongly suggests stagflation that business activity is dying off but prices are remaining high. And that makes the Federal Reserve's job very, very difficult because, you know, they would want to bring interest rates down. But if they do that, you know, inflation could really get out of control because it's already kind of hints that it's coming back. Right. right? So 
today, that's the big thing that people are going to be paying attention to. And there was actually a story yesterday, I think, from the Wall Street Journal, um, when the Federal Reserve kind of wants to like let the, the market know about something and they can't say anything directly, they will often give it to Nick Timros at the Wall Street Journal. And he said yesterday that, that the Fed is, anti uh, is anticipated to uh, signal to the market that they're willing to hold interest rates higher for longer. Okay. So uh, this is where the game that they play <laughs> it, during the press conference gets kind of interesting, right? Because the, the whole game, and I've seen every press conference ever because, you know, it's, it's a relatively recent phenomenon you know, thing. They, they didn't do it when I first started trading, right? Right, and, right. And, and, and the whole thing is basically all of the journalists get on and they try and get the Federal Reserve president to say something super significant so they can go back to their boss and say, like, how good of a journalist am I that I got them to say this thing or that thing, right? And then Powell attempts to answer their questions without actually saying anything significant, right? <laughs> that yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't want the market to overreact to what he says, right? It's a game. And, it's a game. It, it really is. It really is. And, and now we're in a situation where the Federal Reserve does seem to have something that it wants to say. They've already kind of warned us. Everybody's kind of anticipating it. And, and it's kind of there's this what's been happening recently is that like even if he comes out and he's hawkish, uh, the market will come out and interpret it as dovish because like if he doesn't say, well, I'm, I'm actually kind of starting to think that we might have to raise rates like, you know, like the bar that he has to hit for it to be hawkish. It ends up being really, really high, and that's kind of the thing that's going on today, and and what you might see, and and why there's so much focus on this Federal Reserve meeting. Yeah, and you know, I think there's one thing that's been recent too that's that's thrown into the mix. There is during the blackout period, they can't speak, but you know who does speak? <laughs> Former Fed Chair Janet Yellen. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. And and so I think, you know, what's interesting about that is that could be somewhat of a of I won't say minefield, but it, it might not help help the Fed's case sometimes if if their if her opinion uh, differs from what what Chair Powell might say. And, and you know, I just think that's one extra thing in the mix that they that Fed uh, uh, Powell, uh, Fed Chair Powell has to deal with. Because she can say, you know, she can come in. And she's not uh, beholden to that uh, blackout period, and um, yeah. she represents the administration more than the Fed, and so that's just another. You know, she has a voice. She has a voice, having the experience she had, and I, I think that's come up. You know, the last I don't know three, three meetings, maybe four meetings, where she's kind of said something, and it might not be in line with what the Fed wants to say as well. Well, yeah, I, I mean, the administration definitely wants things to be easy right now. I, I don't yep. think that that's a, a mystery to anybody. They've got an election coming up and they want the economy to look strong. Um, and, and that's where I, things kind of come into. Remember, I said that, like, maybe all of this stuff doesn't matter. Um, so so I, I got to caution you guys, if, if you haven't traded, you know, if you're new and you haven't traded a Federal Reserve before, do not read too much into the initial reaction or the action the day of. I think the best example that, that I can think of is when they introduced QE2 back in like uh, 2012 or somewhere around then, right? right. And there was, uh, there was so much anticipation. I, I don't know if there will ever be a, a Fed meeting that, that was bigger than that one where, where they were expected to announce QE2. And they did it. And, you know, there was a lot of people at the time that were like, well, the economy must be really bad if they really feel like they need to do this. And, and there was all these different opinions about what effect it was going to have. And so by the end of the day, the S&P 500 was down on the day after the meeting. And, and any of you that remember the history will know that that was probably the single best day to buy the S&P 500 like ever, because then... That was more liquidity in the market, and that's liquidity is more orders. And, it, you know, it was just all up from there. And that was like one of the biggest bull runs ever, right? right. And the, the market got it wrong the day of, right? So 
I think that there is a, a good probability of that happening. And, and here's why. Uh, there are changes to the liquidity in the interest rate market happening right now. On Monday, they announced the, the refunding announcement, like how much money does the uh, government need to raise from issuing coupons, right? And then today, they put out a little report that explains like how are they oh. going to get all of that right issues right so the what we found out today because there's been this uh, kind of uh, thing where they're putting a lot of it into bills right they they, they don't want to take out exposed for like 30 years right current interest rates so so they want it to be in the the short term ones and there's this concern that like if they have to issue too many short-term bills, that that floods the markets and, and pushes interest rates up, right? And so Yellen has been doing her best to avoid doing that. And that's what we found out this morning is that like they're keeping things the same. So that's not, not really an issue as much. I think that you have to look at it auction by auction, but you know, the, the scenario where the market just gets flooded by bills and, you know, it really, you know, that's not as much of an issue. And then the other thing is, is that they anticipate, or we anticipate rather, that the Federal Reserve will say something about the, uh, the taper because, you know, they have assets, they have bonds that they already hold, and they, they basically just let them roll off. Like they, they just right. hold they them don't through replace expiration them. and then yeah. they don't replace them, right? right. And um, there's been a lot of, you know, there's been banks going down and things like that. And, and so th them doing that uh, kind of, you know, the, the market it has a little bit of a hard time with it. And so they have kind of been feeling for a while and they've been warning us that, you know, they're going to slow that down so that, you know, it can kind of support the, the fixed income the market a, a right. little bit. Right. Right. And so, so those are two things that, that I would say are, are positive for treasuries, negative for interest rates, right? That, that would cause interest rates to come down a little bit. Uh, so that's where it's kind of like, you know, the market is going to have their reaction to what Powell says today. But uh, these, these things that are going on with liquidity may actually matter a lot more in the long run. If, if I was going to, you know, I don't think that I would take a bet right now because we, we have a you know, a, a non-farms meeting on Friday and it's super risky and all of that. But, you know, if, if you held my feet to the fire and had me say long or short today, I, I would be long treasuries into the meeting. I, I think that that overall the, the risks are balanced towards the market and tr uh, treating his comments as more dovish than expected, even though they're not. And, you know, caring more about the changes in issuance that are happening right now. So, you know, one thing that you, you mentioned non-farm payrolls, there's a, there, there are some other labor market reports that came out, right? There's ADP, mm -hmm. there's jolts. Um, and those seem like those are trending in the right direction for their mandate, right? They want to have a strong labor market. You know, I would say ADP came out higher than expected, which was, you know, positive and it's in the right places right it's in the manufacturing sector it's not yeah uh you know it's not manufacturing is flat it's it's actually growing which is good um jolts i didn't dig into the report it seemed like job openings going down could be you know a tale of two cities right it could be good um, yeah those are being filled those... or they're taken off the table right so i got to dig into that um but so so there's all sorts of little nuances with those two reports that you mentioned specifically too. like a lot of people aren't really buying the numbers that come out from the, the BLS the jolts. Right. Be, right. Well, not yeah. just from the BLS. I mean, that's a different thing. But but the jolts report in general, because, you know, this is like how many job openings are there out there? And, and a lot of companies are putting openings out there that they don't really intend to fill. So they're, they're I, building you know, a resume database yeah. and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've the heard that. market cares about that data point because Powell mentioned it specifically in a press conference, you know, a federal reserve press conference, like we're having today, like back in uh, July, or August or something like that. And so right. all of the algorithms really care about it, but that, that report in particular, I, I question 
how much information that one in particular is giving. And what, what was the other one that you had mentioned just uh, the ADP that? report that came uh, out? The, the ADP report is is a really good report to look at, but it has not been very indicative lately of how the non farms are going to come out. And and right. when you're talking about non farms in particular, like I'm, I mean, we've blown the consensus estimate on non farms like the last six meetings. So like I it's anybody's guess. What, sure. what happens on Friday, right? Right. Yeah, and, and you're right. I think you put it in a polite manner to say that those two reports haven't jived for quite a while um, yeah. for whatever reasons, right? It's just two different sources and could be two different collection mechanisms, could be two different data pools, right? But, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are people who think there's other things at play and whatever it is. Um, I, I just think this idea of uh, that, that's part of the picture of a, maybe a soft landing. Maybe it isn't so soft, uh, you know, coming up and well, you know, well, right. we we do appear to be having a soft landing though. I I think that that's you know, but it, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? Because the soft landing is a little bit of weakness coming in. It's just not so weak that we go into a recession, right? So right, right. I think it, it's TBD. Um, you're right. Mm. You know, that's that that's good. I think today you're right though about the interest rates. It's all interest rates today. Oh, um, oh totally. And but, um. You, Go you ahead. know, to, to that point, um, you, one of the things that will come up in this situation is, does the Federal Reserve know what the non-farms is going to be? We have a lot of information in the past to suggest that in this situation, they do get it, but they always kind of play coy. I'm going to bet you that you'll see a question about that. Somebody will ask and, you know, can't really <laughs> answer it because he, he can't tell you what the report is, but. Right. They, they it, factor that in to what they're saying today. So it's it'll be interesting to see if the journalists are aren't coy about it. Right. Is it a gotcha question or is it like they're just going to say, right. do you know? Right. Um, Seth, we're running out of time. This was uh, mm. this went by way too fast. So I think we'll do it again later this week. Uh, talking about non-farm payrolls yeah, on Friday. Talk on Friday. So, that, so where that's going to be. Can, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, I, I, it, that's going to be crazy. I, I would just one thing about that. You know, something that I think would be real helpful to people, pay attention to those PMIs because that's one of the most forward looking data points that we have. So like that ISM that we got today, I, I think was a really big deal. And and again, it kind of suggests stagflation. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, we appreciate you coming on. And how can people find you? Okay, so uh, I'm Speculator Seth everywhere. So you can find me on my YouTube channel. I actually um, put out a video on Monday that's about momentum strategies that will help you see a lot about how the the big funds in the future space act so if you're in the future space i think it's a video you really want to watch um just search for speculator seth i'm also i'm on twitter we have a discord every but you can find you just search for my name yeah don't don't take any imitators it's there's only one speculator seth and um, we're we're very lucky to have you on here so appreciate it and we'll see you friday yeah thank you very much thank you for having me on All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You you can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website.